Hello and welcome to uh, the Vicar Study at St John's in Poole. It's good to have you with us. Particular welcome if you're new to St John's and joining us online. The way we describe our church life here is knowing and sharing the love of Jesus. And we're going to be looking at a little bit today of what it is we're trying to share. Uh, as well as enjoying the wonder of knowing. And uh, our services are at the usual times, which are 9 o'clock and 10.30 on Sunday. And uh, we're looking forward to those, but as well as those things on site, we're continuing our online ministry, hence this video. And uh, I'll be encouraging you, uh, for those of you getting the email that goes with this, I'll be encouraging you to sing the same songs at home that uh, we're doing in church and uh, they are behold our god uh, there's a higher throne speak O lord as we come to you to receive the food of your holy word and amazing grace uh, there'll be some good singing in church on sunday you might like to join us but if you if, if you're not able to join us then uh, do feel free to sing at home because you know the, the God is not worried about the quality of the uh, tonal quality of what comes out of your mouth, but He says, "Make a joyful noise to the Lord." That's what He says in the Psalms. So uh, I pray that you will take time to do that. In a moment, I'll lead us in prayer. But first, we're going to look at and unpack uh, uh, the latest instalment in our series on Mark's Gospel, and this is Mark chapter two, reading the first twelve verses. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. Some men came, bringing a paralysed man, uh, carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it, and then lowered the mat he was the man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some teachers of the law were there, thinking to themselves, Why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts, and he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier, to say, This paralysed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, Get up, take your mat and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. He got up, took his mat and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, We've never seen anything like this. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, if you remember one thing from this morning's sermon, then I want it to be just three words. First things first. First things first. As you can kind of see that in, in the content of this, uh, this amazing event, uh, and also uh, we, we can pick it out in what we deduce from it and the way we live our lives after this event. First things first. In other words, sin is more important than paralysis. And when our need for forgiveness is greater than anything, really, it's a person's greatest need to be right with God. The world's biggest problem is not climate change, it's not terrorism, it's not war, it's not any of those things. It is sin. And we'll see that in this passage. And that's why Jesus says what he does and does what he does to the, with this paralyzed man and in the exchange afterwards with the, the teachers of the law. Now, I want you to exercise a bit of imagination. For those of you uh, uh, close to here in Paul, 
then it's quite easy. Just imagine yourself down at the beach and uh, looking out to sea and you've got um, you've got old, old Harry Rock over there on the right and the, the needles at the end of the of Isle of Wight on the left. Imagine they join up. Imagine they join up. Then that chunk of water that you've got in front of you, as you've imagined, that is roughly the size of the Sea of Galilee. Actually, it's a bit bigger, but um, that's of the same order of magnitude as the Sea of Galilee. It's something like that. And the, the, the scene where this takes place today is um, uh, on the north shore of, of Lake Galilee. It's in the, the town of Capernaum, where Jesus lives. It's, a, it's only about 20 miles from Nazareth, where he grew up. So it's not far away, but he has moved far enough away to get a little bit out on his own, away from his folks and that, that kind of thing. Uh, and it, Imagine, you know, you know, it's on the it's on the north edge of the Sea of Galilee. So you've got the Sea of Galilee in front of you there, and imagine instead of just those slightly interesting, but slightly puny hills uh, by Old Harry and uh, the um, round, round the Needles, imagine you've got rather bigger ones, and so the, there are some mountains around uh, and and stuff like that. That's kind of the scene that you'd have at Galilee, and you, you know, as you look out to see from uh, uh, from Capernaum, you'd have um, uh, on your right, you'd have Tiberius, uh, which was where the Romans not obviously it's named after one of their emperors, so that's that's a key town for them. On your left, you've got the Golan Heights uh, leading up into Syria, and and so on. And behind you, uh, you've got the hillside. Uh, the hills coming down to the sea where um, uh, Jesus uh, is you know, traditionally thought to have fed 5,000 people and so on. Uh, so you, you, that's the scene we're imagining today. Jesus lived in Capernaum and uh, as I said it was only 20 miles of earth from where he originally came from in Nazareth, though he wasn't born there of course, he was born in Bethlehem but um, Nazareth was where he grew up, where his family home was. Anyway, Jesus had moved 20 miles away and he was in Capernaum. Um, the crowds were getting quite interested in the amazing things that he was saying and doing at this point. So um, they were gathering around his home or, or the place where he was, was preaching. Uh, I've always felt slightly sorry, by the way, um, uh, for whoever's uh, house this was, um, uh, we don't know, it doesn't say, um, because their roof gets taken apart, doesn't it? Uh, and the suggestion that I've heard, one of the suggestions I've heard is that actually it might even have been Jesus's house that he was preaching in. So Jesus not only uh, had all the gossip ministry, but he might have had a destroyed roof as well. Uh, those of the, of the Church of the Good Shepherd are going to have a close-up view of uh, taking off a roof uh, very soon uh, as our old building is taken apart and a new one uh, eventually comes in, in its place. Um, you might want to just imagine uh, the different ways, the different things that might happen well, I mean, the roof of the Church of the Good Shepherd is actually going to be taken apart very carefully because the old tiles have got some asbestos in them. So in order not to release any asbestos dust and so on, they'll be taken off carefully and put into bags and so on, and probably du and double bag all the thing, all the re requirements that are there for them. Uh, and so, most artists, when they render this scene, They've got in mind some, or they're depicting anyway, something a little bit like that. There's a nice, clean, neat edged hole made in the roof. Uh, and Jesus under, underneath, and look, look, everybody look, look, looks completely untroubled by what's going on up above as the man is lowered and so on. And it might have been just like that. Uh, on the other hand, it might have been a bit more um, hit and miss. There might have been, it might have been down below and there's bits of falling masonry and tiles and 
battens and various bits and pieces uh, are coming down. And uh, I mean, first, verse 4 of our passage doesn't spell out the details. But um, you, know, you can imagine that it might not have been quite so neat as a lot of artists portrayed this scene. Anyway, the paralysed man gets lowered. And we're, we're told one reason, we're told there's four, four people, four of his friends who are lowering him, and I guess they're one at each quarter, one at each corner on it on a sort of stretcher-like thing, lowering him down uh, to Jesus. And by, this certainly gets Jesus's attention, and Jesus is very happy to heal him. But uh, the the first thing he does is not what they expect. The people would have expected their paralyzed friend uh, to um, be healed just straight off, just like that, probably. Because uh, they, they've got the impression, they, they, word was getting around that Jesus could do this kind of thing, and that, no doubt, is what they were hoping for. And indeed, in due course, he does get healed. But uh, that's... Uh, a really really good example of there being something deeper going on uh, when I preach on this on Sunday at Good Shepherd one of the things I shall do is use a very strange picture which has a slightly not so great looking carpet on one half and a load of wood lice on the other half and the reason I'll have that is because um, obviously the vicarage is where we live and uh, we're very pleased to live here. But uh, the house that Becky and I own is uh, is not this one. It's in Oxford. It's a much more modest uh, three-bed semi that we lived in for three, for three years while I was training. And then we've let it out ever since. Uh, but the letting agents contacted me recently to say, your carpet is going a bit not so great uh, in down, downstairs. And, um, oh... We looked underneath and we can see this and wood lice having a really nice meal. And uh, that's why the carpet is going, because the floor is going uh, underneath it. And, uh, you yeah, know, that really isn't good. So, uh, you yeah, know, not surprising that the agent uh, says you need, you're going to need some new carpet. And, uh yeah, it's, it's that difference in a way. But what you see on the surface and what the need is underneath at a deeper level, that's the kind of thing that Jesus is getting at here. The guy's surface need is the fact that he's suffering from paralysis. Uh, and that's a significant problem that he's got. It would have been a bigger, a more significant problem then than now because you know just the, the it's hard enough now if I think about my friends in wheelchairs and things like that then it's you know it's difficult now but it would have been a lot harder then uh, but Jesus is looking beyond the man's surface need towards what his deeper need is and that's why then Jesus says he says in verse 5, he says, I've underlined it in my Bible because it's the heart of this passage. Son, your sins are forgiven. Son, your sins are forgiven. And of course, then the teachers of the law get all outraged about how dare Jesus say this. And if you read on a couple of verses to, uh, but to verse 7, it says, why does this fellow uh, talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Now that's a very interesting statement because in one way they were exactly right to ask that question. But they were completely wrong in the conclusion that they deduced. I, I found myself thinking about it, trying to think logically, and I, I can't help the fact that Mr. Spock of Star Trek is the image that comes to mind. Think about it logically. Jesus has said, Son, your sins are forgiven. Uh, only God can forgive sins. That is true. That is exactly what 
is true. That's what they say. But there, but there are two possible deductions from that. One is that the, the person saying it is indeed blaspheming. He's claiming to be God when he's not. Or the one that is actually true, that the person before them, Jesus, really is God. He's God in human form. And that's why he can say, son, your sins are forgiven. The result of all this, I mean, we, 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 we then, of course, immediately after that exchange about those words uh, about the sins being forgiven, because uh, that's the person's deepest need, then the surface need gets sorted out. Jesus says, well, okay, I want, I want people to know that I've got the power to do these things. I can say your sins are forgiven. And just I'll, I'll just show you, by the way, uh, he, sa he says, um, oh, take out your mat and walk. Small deal, really, isn't it? No, it's a very big deal. And uh, Jesus says, take up your mat and walk. And that's exactly what he does. And of course, the uh, inference is that actually the other things that uh, Jesus said he's got the power to do as well. Just like saying, take up your bed and walk. Uh, he's able to say, well, it, your sins are forgiven. Not just say it, but it be true. The man's sins are forgiven. The result of the, all this, by the way, look at um, the middle of verse 12, our last verse in our passage today. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, we've never seen anything like this. The people were truly amazed. And I guess if I was you know, wanting you, I've got you to imagine a scene earlier on, you might want to just imagine some surprised people at this point, some some people looking, <gasps> yeah, how can that, that, that be? That's kind of where Jesus leaves them. But he doesn't want people to just get stuck in being surprised or being confused and so on. I want, I want to take us a bit beyond that to uh, what it says. What did they do? They praised God. They knew they were beyond, they were at the edge of their own comfort zone. They, there were things that they couldn't fathom going on around them. God was at work. And that, in a way, is a challenge for us uh, to respond in ways of recognising God at work. Sometimes we do tend to domesticate Jesus and just try to keep him small. And actually, he's bigger than... Well, next week, I hope, is we're going to sing bigger than big. Uh, God is bigger than big. We've not got our small domesticated Jesus. We've got a God who um, he's, well, to use a word that's in common parlance, is uh, transcendent. He is beyond the, the uh, little restrictions that we sometimes put on him. And my hope is that we will follow the logic of Mr. Spock. We will see that Jesus does forgive and he does heal. God, Jesus, really is God in human form. And that's why we can praise him. That's why we can praise him now. Let's do that. Lord, thank you that you are interested not just in what's on the surface. Thank you that you go deeper. You can see what's deep inside. Thank you that you want to address uh, what's wrong, not just our physical and material needs, but also our hidden and spiritual needs. Thank you that in today's passage, Jesus shows that very clearly with the power to forgive and the will to forgive. I want to do things, he says. Thank you, Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer.
Lord, sorry for the times when we've got our priorities wrong, when we have not put first things first. Sorry for the times when we've been uh, so muddled in our thinking that we've got too bogged down in either health or weather or sport or whatever else it might be. Sorry, Lord, for the times when our own lack of clarity about things has impacted the way we have either shared or not shared, failed to share the good news of Jesus. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Please, Lord, when we reflect on the amazing things that Jesus said and did, Help us not to get stuck at the stage of being amazed and confused. Help us to respond in the right way, in what we deduce and in what we do, with Jesus himself, God in human form. Lead us to worship, to pray, to praise, and so on. And we pray that because of all that, Lord, we will be involved in the process of sharing the good news of Jesus. May it ripple out to those around. We think of those ripple effects. We started off with the scene of a lake. And uh, we think about what happens if you uh, put a, throw a stone into a lake. Um, you get ripples. And we pray that um, there will be good, godly ripples rippling out from us where you are at work Lord in your mercy hear our prayer and we'll end by saying together the words that Jesus taught us our Father in heaven hallowed be your name your kingdom come your will be done on earth as in heaven give us today our daily bread Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. See you next time.